Publishing Company. Okay, uh, next we have uh, Capital Power, uh, the CEO, uh, Sandra Haskins, and she will be moderated by Caroline Saomoto from IR Labs. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having us here, Dan and Shannon, for hosting this amazing event. Uh, today, uh, we have Capital Power. Uh, they are one of the leading power producers in North America, traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And uh, I have with me Sandra Haskins. She is the SVP Finance and Chief Financial Officer. So just to kickstart uh, the conversation, we're going to introduce you to a quick little video here about Capital Power. Building the leading power producer in North America. At Capital Power, we're taking a balanced approach to the energy transition to be net zero by 2045. We deliver reliable, affordable, and decarbonized power generation through optimizing grid critical natural gas assets, building renewable and lower carbon power generation capacity, and creating real net zero power solutions, including carbon capture utilization and storage. Across the US and Canada, we're delivering innovative power solutions that our customers and communities can depend on. Get to know us at capitalpower.com. Thank you. So that's a little bit about Capital Power, and we're now going to dive in. So Sandra, we're now here today uh, in a Women in Investing event. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience? Yeah, so um, I've been in the power generation uh, business and industry for over 20 years, including um, being with Capital Power since its IPO in uh, 2009. Um, we are listed, as Carolyn mentioned, on the Toronto Stock Exchange, um, currently with a market cap of about 4.4 billion Canadian, which is about three and a half billion in US dollars. Uh, as we continue to grow our footprint, we're looking at uh, the right time to be listed on the US Stock Exchange at some point. So that is an aspiration of ours to be dual listed. Um, as we've grown um, over the last number of years, we've accessed the, the debt and equity markets to raise about four billion of uh, Canadian dollar funds uh, to fuel our fuel our growth. So we definitely have become a, a growth oriented energy transition company. Thank you, Sandra. And for those who might not be as familiar with Capital Power, can you give us a little bit more history and background of the company? Sure. So Capital Power was spun out of a fully integrated uh, utility that was uh, over 100 years old. And that came about because uh, in Alberta, the province of Alberta, they decided to deregulate the generation line of business. So as a result of that, Capital Power was created. We are still headquartered in Edmonton, Alberta, but we have 29 facilities across uh, Canada and the US. So we are, operate in three Canadian provinces and nine US states. So we have a, a highly efficient, uh, highly contracted fleet of, of assets, which provide a stable cash flow, uh, which allows us to be investment grade. Uh, we are currently uh, triple B minus with S&P and triple B low with DBRS Morningstar with a stable outlook. Uh, that cash flow stability allows us to continually grow our dividend as well as fund our growth initiatives. So we have had 10 years of consecutive dividend increases and have provided guidance for a 6% annual dividend increase out through 2025. Um, as far as our, our growth, Capital Power not only uh, operates facilities, but we build and acquire uh, facilities as well. So on the growth side, we look to target midlife natural gas uh, assets. So we have a proven track record of acquiring midlife natural gas assets in markets where they've delivered critical elements of reliability for the markets in which they, they operate. Uh, okay. We've got a track record of recontracting all of those acquisitions. So feel that we are proving out our strategy. We also look to build new facilities in, in terms of accelerating renewables. So we build wind and solar and as well as, as uh, energy storage. So in 2023, uh, we just announced in the fourth quarter, three new acquisitions, um, one in Arizona, 
one in California and one in, in, Cal in um, Washington state. So very active on, on, the on the acquisition side. In development right now, we have a, a wind farm in Alberta, a solar farm in uh, North Carolina, and five projects in Ontario that are gas expansion and upgrade projects, as well as the incorporation of battery storage. So very, very bro fast growing uh, pace of growth. Um, the other thing about capital power is not only are we delivering affordable power for today, but we're also focused on sustainability in the future. So we have a target to be net zero by 2045 and have a pathway uh, that we feel we can get there through accelerating our build out of renewables, focusing on decarbonization strategies such as CCS and uh, and um, moving forward as well on um, on other technologies that we see emerging and could could be part of that all of the above solution to decarbonization. Thank you, Sandra. That's great to hear. Um, what are the, the the core strengths or competitive advantages of the company within the market? Yeah, so I'd say there's five things that we really kind of focus on in terms of our strength and all of them one way or another come back to our people. We have a strong bench uh, bench strength of expertise within our organization that has uh, been able to propel us forward to where we are today. So I'd start by saying we have a focus on reliable power. And so by having a fleet of high performing assets, uh, that provides our stable cash flow, which is the foundation of, of the organization. When you look beyond that, our balance sheet strength is partly funneled by that strong cash flow, as well as we are highly committed to in maintaining our investment grade credit rating. We have very effective uh, risk management um, practices around our, our trading facilities, as, as well as our other commercial and financial risks that just maintain the strength of our balance sheet. We're very disciplined in our growth. So when we're looking at growth opportunities, we always make sure that we're funding in a way that maintains our investment grade credit rating. We have expertise on both the technical and on the market side of, uh, of, of the business that allows us to target those projects that are accretive to our cash flow, which then ensures that we continue to be able to increase our dividend. And as well as um, being able to um, continue to to grow in a in a very disciplined in fashion that in turn um, leads to our operational excellence so i would say that given our 100 year history in in power generation we have deep expertise that it really allows us to focus on the right opportunities for growth so when we're doing our due diligence we can find those assets that are midlife so you want to ensure the operating capabilities of the plant as well as the opportunities to enhance and optimize around those assets that operational excellence is is something that brings to bear both our sustaining operations as well as our as our growth and has been a, a key part of our success and a part of our history and something that does in, differentiate us from others that are interested in in that same area of growth but doesn't bring that deep expertise that does add that extra accretive value and lastly is the sustainability so we do know that uh, we have the expertise to be able to advance decarbonization solutions as they emerge and and we're mindful that there are are a number of opportunities out there and uh, feel that we will be very well positioned with uh, our expertise to be able to look for commercially and financially uh, uh, viable solutions and be able to bring them on as we continue to advance our our operations Thank you, Sandra. And as you continue talking about growth and sustainability, what is Capital Power strategy on those two fronts? So we really have um, what we call a, a three pillar or three parallel pathways in terms of our strategy. And we've characterized them as deliver, build and create. So when you think of deliver, that's delivering um, a reliable and affordable power for today. And so for us, that means optimizing the facilities that we have to ensure that they are the most efficient and uh, generate the most, the highest margin uh, possible. But it also means that we're targeting the midlife gas uh, acquisitions 
to continue to provide uh, reliable power in those markets. So we see as the penetration of renewables uh, continues to, to evolve, you need that dispatchable power to stabilize the grid and enable electrification in those markets. So a key part of our strategy is finding those right assets, making those acquisitions to provide that so support within those markets. On the build side, we're looking at accelerating the growth of renewables. We tend to uh, co commit capital to about two to three renewable projects per year uh, in both wind and solar. And so we continue to build out that particular uh, part of the business as well to toward, directed towards uh, clean, clean energy. On the create side, we find ourselves highly focused on emerging technologies. As I said, we're looking forward to provide those decarbonization solutions for tomorrow. So we see natural gas as a, a key part of the energy transition. Um, but beyond that, we're looking for what are the solutions to take us, take us further to a cleaner grid by 2045, that coming through an all of the above approach. So whether it's, it's uh, direct air capture, carbon capture storage, we tend to monitor all of those, those elements as we, as we look to find uh, ways to create decarbonization solutions for our partners. Uh, talk about a little bit more on your decarbonization priorities. Can you outline some of the technologies that you're deploying in your fleet today? Yeah, as I mentioned, we do build out wind and solar uh, currently. Uh, this year, we announced a, a partnership with First Solar for one gigawatt of solar panels that would meet the domestic content requirements to have the maximum ITC um, uh, eligibility. So we continue on that front. Um, we're also looking at incorporating battery storage into a number of our, of our facilities. But I would say the largest decarbonization uh, project that we've taken to date was just with the movement of, of going off of coal. So we are repowering uh, a facility in Alberta, which is our Genesee uh, um, natural gas. You would have seen that in the video that was just shown. It's a, a currently a coal facility, and in, next year we will be moving completely off coal with the repowering of that unit. It's a $1.3 billion project, which will increase the capacity at the plant. So we'll be adding about 500 uh, additional megawatts of capacity. When that project's complete, Genesee will be the most efficient natural gas combined cycle facility in Canada. So we'll see a reduction in the um, in the intensity of the carbon emissions by 60%, despite there being an almost 60% increase in the capacity. And as a result, the absolute emissions, uh, redu emissions re produced from that facility will be 40% lower. And that's despite the fact that you've got the, the significantly increased capacity. It also has the knock-on effect of displacing less efficient units out of the market. So not only are we reducing at our own facility, but we're also cleaning the grid within the Alberta market by introducing that facility. Now, part of Capital Power's approach to uh, having a very balanced approach to the energy transition is, is on display with respect to that particular project, because you see where there could be the opportunity just to close the facility, uh, the natural gas facility, take the $1.3 billion and deploy it towards something else in terms of a clean energy solution. But when you think about the uh, being in a, a northern climate where it's quite cold, you need to have reliable, dispatchable um, uh, generation available at all times. So we're coming up now to almost the shortest day of the year, which in Alberta will be about six or eight hours of sunlight. So any solar facilities that you have have pretty marginal impact in terms of being able to provide power, especially in the winter when, when it is cold and you do need the heating and the light. In addition to that, we have extreme cold uh, weather at certain periods of time. And there's been times where we've gone days or weeks with 30 or 40 degrees Celsius, which is also extremely cold in Fahrenheit, as I can assure you. Um, and what you will notice, if you go outside on a day that is that cold, the air is not moving, so it's very still. So the wind generation on the grid just falls completely off. So you're sitting there with few hours of daylight, extreme cold, and no renewables on the system. And so even the best batteries available will only allow you to shift power by a matter of hours, 
where what we need is to be able to fill, you know, extension of days. So that's where you need to have that dispatchable gas. And so for us, um, the, the need for baseload in that province makes this, this project extremely, extremely important for Albertans to have that continued reliable and affordable uh, energy supply. Thank you, Sandra. The topic of the future of energy is so important. Um, how do you see, you know, the energy transition and the future and how does capital power play a role in the market in the next 10 to 20 years? Yeah, so the way that we think about, you know, the the future is that it's there's you've heard it already said this morning, there's no one silver bullet there's no one generation that's going to be right it's going to be an all of the above approach and i think that the solution it will be dependent on the market that you're in so every market will be somewhat different it'll depend on your your resource endowment what the current market structure is as well as um what what the um actual assets or the legacy assets are, are. so we see that there's multiple types of of uh, solutions that could come to bear um, we see direct air capture, uh, SMRs, as well as hydrogen and hydrogen blending, all having possibilities in, in, in a certain timeline, as well as carbon capture and storage for those areas that do have the right geology in order to be able to apply that, that technology. In the case of our Genesee facility that we are repowering, we have been uh, working for about a year or just over a year now and looking at the feasibility of, uh, of carbon capture and storage at that facility, which if implemented would make that a near zero emitting uh, facility. So we, we uh, finalized the feed study in terms of the technology um, earlier this year. So we got to the point where we did have a technically viable near shovel ready uh, project that that we could um, implement um, so from from that perspective uh, we we also needed the other elements of, of um, the advancing that technology which included the financing of it as well as the carbon assurances so um, in canada like in the u.s there is uh, the focus from uh, the government to provide investment tax credits that would fund up to 50% of the eligible expenses for, for that project. And, and the construct in Canada would be a direct pay, which means that you're getting that funding as you're constructing the project, which helps with the strain on your balance sheet. So as opposed to be being paid for every ton of carbon that you buried, you're actually paid for creating and building the infrastructure, which goes a long way for moving the economic uh, economics. There's also pools of funding of low cost debt that are available for decarbonization uh, projects such as CCS and we were in discussions on on that funding and, and there were two pockets of, of funding that were available that would uh, cover about one third of the capital costs uh, required for that project. So for us that meant that between ourselves and an Indigenous partner we would be looking at about a six or seven hundred million dollar investment um, in carbon capture to complete that project, which is a, a definitely a very doable bite size for, for our company. Um, at this point, we remain in conversation on the commercial arrangements with the government. So there is uh, a lot of push and, uh, and support uh, across the government to get these sorts of projects done. So see this as something that, you know, if over the next year, year and a half, you were to get to an FID, it is a solution that would be available before the end of the decade. So certainly one that, that we see as uh, uh, moving along quite quite quickly and does have a, an application in, in a number of markets that where we have assets today. Thank you, Sandra. And going back to your comment about your strategic growth, um, you know, you mentioned that you just did a 1.1 billion strategic acquisition recently. Uh, can you talk about the strategies, uh, the rationale around that? Yeah, so the acquisition of Harkawala in Arizona, as well as La Paloma in California, are right down the middle of the fairway of the type of midlife natural gas acquisitions that we look to do. They are uh, contracted with uh, investment grade counterparties out to 2029 and 2031. Uh, they generate uh, highly contracted cash flow that allows us to uh, increase and support our dividend growth. Um, 
So uh, in, in all respects, that's, that um, does, does meet all of our criteria for, for our growth. They're well-maintained assets. We're familiar with the technologies that are used uh, at those facilities. But I would say one of the ringing endorsements of this acquisition with respect to our strategy is just how we went about financing it. So Harkoala is uh, in Arizona, and we bought that in, in partnership with BlackRock on a 50-50 uh, JV partnership. As well, we went to the equity markets to raise 400 million of equity to finance the, the uh, project. And we had a large uh, um, uh, AIMCO, which is a fund manager in Canada, come in for a 100 million private placement uh, as part of that, that offering. So we see that type of institutional support being a, a real validation for our, our strategy and our ability to execute uh, both as, as an acquirer and an operator of those facilities. That's great to hear. Thank you. And are there specific regions or markets where the company is particularly interested in the future? Yeah, so I think there's three things that we kind of look at when we're looking at opportunities. So you're looking at uh, uh, good fundamentals in, in the market. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for um, a market that has strong demand and is is a growing demand. And that just ensures the the, the requirements for your your facility are being met, you have the ability to contract and recontract those. And so that's something that, you look, that you're that you looking for as you, we see ourselves as playing a, a critical role in uh, helping support electrification. And, and typically those fundamentals are part of um, markets that are looking for electrification. So that commitment to the grid and cleaning of the grid is another element there. So uh, our assets help with the uh, intermittency of renewables as they build out. It provides grid support um, for um, the number of coal facilities. So when you're looking at markets that have high emitting um, assets, you know that's another area where you see the, the longer term need for natural gas. Um, and, and then I think it's just around the construct or the transparency of the market. So we create a lot of value through our, our trading and effective risk management around the assets. So just understanding how those markets perform become critical for, uh, for you to be able to execute and, and manage those, those risks effectively. And also when you're making investment decisions in terms of uh, construction and building out of, of new assets, you wanna make sure you have clarity around how that the amount that market is performing. I would say when you think about specifically what markets does that uh, uh, translate to, I think we've started to see an evolution in our strategy around four different hubs. So when you go back a number of years and we first started looking at acquiring midlife natural gas assets, we were very opportunistic. So we still used that filter or that, that lens, if you will, to determine which assets and which markets we want to play in. But now what we've sort of seen is that we have uh, real, really started to evolve our growth in, in, in four areas. So I'd say in Canada, we're in Alberta, that's our home province, as well as the province of Ontario. Those are two key areas for us. We have now made a number of acquisitions uh, along the U.S. West, or what is known in the market, uh, the WEC uh, industries, or WEC market. Um, so that becomes another hub for us. And the, these last three acquisitions that we have done have all helped us build out that market. And then the fourth one is MISO, which is sort of uh, built around um, the, the Midwest. So uh, in 2022, we acquired the uh, MCV, which is a, a large asset in, in um, Illinois that uh, we partnered with Manulife for Hancock on, on as well. So those four areas we find have those characteristics that we're looking for and have become sort of our, our focal areas of, of where we look to, to build and grow. Thank you. Before I move on to my last uh, couple questions, any any questions for Sandra right now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's on. Uh, hi, Sandra. Hi. Um, we're in a very historic room, and maybe not to go off too off topic in terms of the investment case of Capital Power, but you've had um, an incredible career and you're very modest about it. Um, and I was promised to hear a bit more on it. 
Um, so maybe can you just talk to, and maybe just for a lot of people inspiring to, to maybe have a big career like yourself, could you talk to maybe some career advice and also the different challenges you've experienced throughout your career? You are one of the first um, C-suite executives in the resources space. So maybe just talk to that if that's okay. Yeah, it's a question I get asked and one I'm not very good at answering. I, I wish I could be more inspirational um, in terms of being helpful to, to others. And um, I, you know, I, I don't know that I uh, set out to, to accomplish anything other than to do the best work that I could do, be fueled by the passion of, of what I was doing and always try to deliver your best work and, and be your authentic self. And I know that's cliche, but there's, there's really no silver bullet. I think if you have the, the talents, the God-given talents to do something, the ability and the de desire to do it, that should be your, your guiding light. And, and um, you know, I think that, that it pays off. And I think, you know, just having confidence in your own ability and believing in yourself is, is, in, is important to, uh, to, to reach those goals. So um, I think that it's incredible the amount of support that women get today and the recognition that they get and the opportunities they get. And I would just encourage people to, to reach for those opportunities. I think that we hear constantly how women all, uh, often will feel that unless they can walk into a job and do 100% of it day one, as soon as you step into the role, then you're not eligible to do it. And I would say you really need to challenge yourself. If you're not stepping out or stepping into a role where you feel you have things to learn, things to grow, things to accomplish, then then you're not challenging yourself and you won't reach your your ultimate goal. So I just uh, encourage people to to be be courageous uh, believe in yourself and and uh, don't don't uh, don't take a take a back seat. So that would be would be my advice. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra. I think all of us need a little bit of that every day. Just be courageous and you know um, always you know feel motivated. So uh, thank you for that. Any other questions? Um, so. Sandra, I know in terms of your shareholders, you have some institutional, some retail investors as well. And I know in the room today, we have some retail investors. Do you uh, have, any, you know, can you provide maybe the three key takeaways for the audience in the room today? Yeah, so a good question. I think that um, I would say that we have a, a proven track record at, uh, at Capital Power. So we uh, definitely deliver on our stable growing div uh, dividend, which I know is important to, to investors. We have a, a long-term goal of total shareholder return of 12% and are, are delivering on that. Um, we are also a very innovative uh, company. I would say that um, we, we have uh, aspirations to be net zero by 2045, which is a goal that used to be 2050, but with all of the tailwinds that we have seen um, to our strategy, which I would say that capital power strategy was not always in favor. If you go back a number of years where there was uh, a view that the silver bullet was the move to renewables with storage, um, that our, we have stayed the course on our strategy and have executed on it successfully. So I would say a key takeaway is this is this is a company that is uh, very well guided and focused and and have deep deep roots and deep expertise in in this in this uh, industry and then and will deliver. So those are two key takeaways I would say. The um, the third is just that we are a, a highly uh, motivated growing company. So with our most recent acquisition, we are now one of the top five natural gas IPPs in North America. Mm -hmm. And uh, that coming from a, a small com company in, uh, in Alberta that was 80% coal not that many years ago and um, have moved forward. So I think that that alone should give us some, some profile in terms of what, what we are able to accomplish. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yes. That we're, we're seeking advice on that as to when when you would be listed, you know, we still are relatively small. Uh, I think we've got a bit of a, a path in terms of getting our presence known throughout the US, getting more recognition across equity research uh, houses that that would start to be able to see 
who we are and what we have to deliver and get our message out. And, and most of the opportunities for growth, I'd say, are more in the U.S. for us. So whether another large acquisition would be a, a catalyst or a good, good timing for that. So we're, we're open to advice as to when, when to do that, but feel that that is something that, that is in our, in our future at some point here. All right, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.